Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and every week I sit down here and I answer your questions and it's an honor. So this is episode 240. Uh, we're moving along week by week and it's nice to see the followers uh, have really, uh, subscribers have really increased recently so I really appreciate that. If you have a question, send them to podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do the best to answer each and every question as they come in. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm not always sure uh, the best answer, but I do my best, okay? Our first question is from Stephen, and Stephen asks a question. I recently purchased the Easy Strength for Fat Loss book, and that's available at uh, danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. And after reading it, I had a question. Uh, I've done a poor job in the past of seeing a program to completion. Um, you know, that by itself, Stephen, is a good question. Lots and lots of people starts lo start lots and lots of programs, and most people don't ever finish them. Uh, it's something I, um, I think about a lot, even in my own training. I sometimes I'll get on this little uh, great program, great idea, and then three weeks later, I'm doing the exact same crap I always do. Summer 2023, I got 20 workouts into a half-hearted Easy Strength for Fat Loss, and then switch gears to the ABC workouts, Armor Building Complex, so thank you so much, despite <laughs> feeling a good amount of progress. I am deciding, one, to not beat myself up about that, and two, to pick up, dust off, and see this program uh, to completion this time. My question is the scheduling of workouts. Now, the moment I go down this road, uh, gentle listener, you have to understand, Stephen's gonna ask a question that you can't find research on, you can't find uh, articles on, you can't find, uh, you know, studies done about his question. So that's why sometimes you have to trust your experience, go with what makes sense and is logical, and listen to his question, and you'll see why uh, I like experience as my favorite of all the methods that we have for getting information. And I tell you, there's inductive, deductive, and all kinds of other methods to figure out things. The scientific method, common sense, which is sometimes the least uh, used, uh, eyewitness, which is probably the one I don't trust the most. And then there's this idea called experience. So there's more too, but let's go. You say to train three to five times a week, uh, eight to 13 weeks for 40 workouts. I currently play in a D-League hockey team about once a week and do a boxing class, which I love, also once a week. Both are high intensity. I go as hard as I can uh, since I'm nearly 40 and I'm not in amazing shape. My shape is mostly spherical, which is correct. Yeah. I am trying to be mindful of recovery while getting my eight hours of sleep and hydrating well, eating like an adult and all the rest. Really appreciate that. So. The first thing you have to think about uh, as when you decide to help someone in a program, you know, what do I know? Well, how many people in the world do we know who want to do easy strength for fat loss, who also box and also play ice hockey? Well, there's not a lot. So what I'm going to use is my experience with my hockey friends and tell, and tell you what they tell me. Do you suggest that someone doing a couple strenuous days of a sport should lean toward the e uh, easy strength for fat loss program three times a week? Or should I stick with the goal of five times per week? I was thinking to split the difference and do four times a week. So five times, three times, four times, doubling up on my boxing day and having two days of rest recovery uh, since hockey day is the one that he really feels bad about. First off, I'm so glad you put easy strength for fat loss in this kind of collection of ideas. As I, I'll tell a lot of people, and in fact, I was just on a phone call before I, I got on here for the podcast, I work with a professional uh, strength coach, a professional uh, sports strength coach that's adopted the easy strength protocols. And we were discussing working around games with him. So what I would suggest is uh, there's, I've got two options for you. I like the first one better. After you do your boxing, I would go into the gym and do your easy strength. Now I know it's different than easy strength for fat loss, but get your boxing in, and then right after, if you can, do probably the most reasonable of the easy strength or fat loss programs that you know. So for me, I always think that two sets of five uh, 
you know, you got the three verticals, you got the vertical press, the vertical pull, a, a deadlift variation, ab wheel and suitcase carry. So maybe whatever is the most reasonable for you. For me, that would be two sets of five or three sets of three. In addition, after your hockey game, now I got this from a, a buddy of mine who's a very good coach in the NHL, is he tries to get his athletes to always lift weights after a home hockey game for sure. It's not perfect, obviously, when you work with professional athletes, you know, you're, you're constantly, you know, the old joke about uh, WD-40 and uh, duct tape, you know, if it's supposed to move and it does good, if it's not supposed to move and it does bad, and then, you know, the answer is either WD-40 or duct tape. And honestly, when you're coaching at the highest level, sometimes you feel like, you know, it's, it's duct tape or WD-40. Folks, I'm joking. Don't use WD-40 on your body nor on uh, duct tape. But it is hard to keep athletes together. A lot's going on. Um, so my first thought is this. Uh, and it's, it's a good question, uh, Stephen. I would suggest training in your most reasonable number of workouts after the boxing and then after the hockey game. Now that's gonna give you, you say you want two full days of recovery, well then take the two full days of recovery after the, the hockey games, do the original strength, uh, do the other stuff that you, you know, uh, mobility, flexibility, go for a walk, whatever. So if you can, if you can work out that you can get a, a workout in, say, say you do your hockey on Saturday and your boxing's on Wednesday, if you can sprinkle in another workout or two in the week, that's what I would suggest. I would always suggest, especially if you're doing this, and this is just an idea, that you do that tonic, easy strength workout. I usually say it's one set of 10, but you take a really light load and you do, you know, you do uh, your military press, one set of 10. You go to the lat machine or whatever you have to do uh, pull-ups with help, maybe with bands or however you do it. One light set of 10 a light set of your deadlift variation, um, a set of five in the ab wheel, um, a quick suitcase carry and be done with it. Now, if you're doing the fat loss one, you want to go for the walk. Uh, after the hockey and boxing practice, I don't think you'll need to, though it, it's not a terrible idea. I'm, I'm a big believer that walking helps with recovery. Uh, I think movement helps with recovery. Um, so that, that, that's what I usually tell people. Uh, I like we have to say here, I, I think it's good. So my basic advice, if you can make this work, after your boxing and your hockey, your reasonable favorite easy strength or fat loss workout, and then try to pick one, two, or three more days a week where you do the more traditional one. And I'm edging you to think that two of those workouts should be that extremely light tonic day just to keep your joints feeling good. And when your schedule starts to clear up a little bit, uh, we can we can slide into a more traditional program. Uh, I hope it helps um, with your age and the, con the considerations you have about your body composition. Uh, walking is going to be your friend. Uh, good nutrition, you noted that. Good sleep, and you noted that too. Um, I would keep doing what you love as long as you can do it because... Um, one of the smartest things I did in my 40s, I still competed at a high level as a discus thrower and Highland Games athlete. I still played American football in my 40s because I liked it. It made me happy. Uh, it, it got me doing things like sprints and, you know, receiver routes and stuff like that and backpedaling and all these other skills that a lot of 40-year-olds wouldn't be doing because being ready for a game is radically different than trying to be ready for remember that thing back at the turn of the century. Oh, I want to be ready for anything. Well, that's great. But when you're playing in a football game, American football game, you've got to be ready to backpedal, sprint, accelerate, cut, you know, <laughs> get knocked down, get back up again, knock someone else down, you know, all those kinds of things. And uh, it gives you an extra level of, of uh, work capacity that's hard to find anywhere else outside of preparing to play with your friends in a game. So good question. And I hope it's, I hope, I hope I helped. So we got a question from Dan. What a lovely name. I'm 36 years old, 210 pounds, and consider myself fairly advanced with kettlebells, having training uh, for them for 10 years. 
I have double 16s, 24, 32, a pole dip station, and a TRX system. I am three weeks into a modified Mass Made Simple routine with kettlebells and have a question. So Mass Made Simple is a barbell program that some people adopt and change into uh, all other kinds of things. Uh, I always find it interesting uh, when people tell me that they're doing the program without the complexes and the high rep back squats, which are the absolute foundation of what the program's about. Uh, let's see how this goes. During this program, should the workout be performed in straight sets or could they be performed in a circuit? I'm currently performing the workouts as straight sets, but find my leg days murderous when doing three sets of 20 squats with double 24s. I'm more of a hinge pull guy. So uh, nowhere in my Mass Made Simple is there three sets of 20. Um, you know, I, I on the Mass Made Simple program, except for workout number 10, I think, I'm pretty sure it's just workout 10, all the workouts end with that really lousy last set of squats. Uh, <laughs> so what you're doing uh, is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but the question is this, curious your take on this as I feel circuits help me balance muscle load and improve my work capacity. I find I take longer breaks when performing straight sets. Well, if it's going to come into hyp hypertrophy, uh, increasing your lean body mass, uh, bodybuilding, whatever phrase you want to use, um, I have a new book coming out and, uh, I'm really focusing in, in this book and in my current work, I'm getting people to do uh, the armor building complex. And somebody always asks in the comments, what is that? Even no matter, I'm about to explain it and someone will still ask in the comments. Uh, maybe not. Um, it's double kettlebells, two cleans, one press, three front squats. I think that is a great mass building program. Two days a week sometimes, one day a week sometimes. I outline it all in the book. And then I also like high rep uh, double kettlebell presses. What we have here is you're, you're doing high rep uh, doubles uh, in the front squat. And I got to tell you, if you're going to do that, I would stick with straight sets. If you're going to do these three sets of 20 with a double 24s, there's nothing wrong with resting between those sets. You know, when I was <laughs> young and gorgeous, when I was young, uh, we used to do those high rep back squat workouts. And I'm not kidding you when I said I rested 20 to 30 minutes between sets. And that one workout I always brag about, you know, June of 2000, June of 1979. Um, you know, I did 315 for 30 squats deep, 275 for 30 squats really deep, and 225 for 30 squats deep. And I only had a spotter on the 315. Uh, and I remember holding on to uh, the Pacifica Barbell Club's uh, Naga Hide Incline Bench Press for dear life. And I was also worried about, you know, being able to drive home uh, on my motorcycle. When you're doing three sets of 20, now remember I was doing three sets of 30, uh, it's gonna take you a while to recover. Uh, I feel that if you're gonna use the squat as a mass building exercise, you gotta respect high rep high rep squats as a mass building exercise you got to respect the time it is the time of you going up and down is the most important part of the workout if it takes you 15 minutes to recover from each one of those sets that's what it takes because the the inroads that these workouts put on your your recovery ability is massive and i'm not just talking about the that, that day's workout where you're doing a 15 minute re uh, rest period. Those high rep back squats, they would eat me up for, you know, well, I, could, I, I finally got to where I could do them about twice a week and keep going. You'll notice in the book, Mass Made Simple, I recommend twice a week high rep back squatting because I don't know how you can recover from it otherwise. I know that some people have written books where you do it three times a week. Uh, I just, I just don't know how you would do that. I mean, consistently over time. Um, you know, the first few weeks I was doing the high rep back squats, I was probably at three, but later I just shifted to, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. And so on Tuesday often was the better day for me because I had Saturday, Sunday, Monday to recover. And then, you know, boom, Tuesday, 
you know, then boom, you know, well, most of the day to recover too on Tuesday. And then you really didn't have much time. Wednesday, Thursday, boom, back in the weight room. Um, I like what you're doing. It's always going to be hard to take a barbell program and translate it into a kettlebell program. A number of people ask me about my kettlebell programs and then ask me to, to make them into barbell programs. That's just as hard. I do have a barbell program in the new book, but it can't be the same as uh, the, double, the, the double kettlebell armor building complex. There has to be changes. And I did my best to put those in. Uh, it's just the nature of the tools. Uh, when kettlebells first showed up, I remember peeping, people you know, writing articles um, that all you need is dumbbells to do kettlebells. And I would, I remember at the time thinking, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. But kind of the deeper, and of course, you know, Dan, you, you're an advanced kettlebell yourself. Once I realized that, that you have to, I, I think anyway, you should hinge, uh, kind of swing, hinge, swing for a clean, it ends up here, for a snatch, it ends up there, for a swing, it ends up over here. But every kettlebell movement is started with that uh, ballistic hinge movement, and it just ends up in these different places. Uh, when I see people train with dumbbells, dumbbells, kettlebell style, they tend to do a lot of things from the dead stop. And in my experience, my personal experience, doing dead stop, like dumbbell snatches, is really hard on my shoulders. Um, and not just because of the throwing injuries, but just hard on my shoulders. So, and, you know, it's one of those things your mileage may vary. Uh, the new book will be out real soon. Um, I like what you're doing. I wish that Daniel would have given me a little bit more information about what you are doing in this modified mass made simple. Because when I see the word mass made simple, my mind goes down to um, that book right somewhere over there. Uh, you're talking about a variation. So I think, you know, I think it's a good idea. I prefer on the hard high rep squats, straight sets. If you want to do complexes for the other stuff, circuit training for the other stuff, I'm fine. But I think for the double kettlebell front squats, you just want to do the set, recover, do the set, recover. And if it's three, do the set and recover. The other stuff you could mix and match a little bit more, either in complexes or in circuit training. Uh, but uh, squats, give, give, give them some rest, okay? Uh, great question. Great question. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Michael has a question, and I like this question from Michael because it's a nice follow-up on some of the information. Uh, it's a follow-up on something I learned from Brian Mann, who I think is really a good uh, strength coach. Uh, he's uh, he's not only a guy, a gym lifter, a uh, power lifter, but he's also somebody with some experience. He's got the academic uh, background, but he also has like the hands-on uh, experience background, when I, and I always like that when I see both. You often talk about the DeLorme protocol in your podcasts and writing. Uh, Captain Dr. Thomas DeLorme, who basically gives us progressive resistance exercise and the concept that you and I both think of in sets and reps. You also mentioned Brian Mann's study and his protocol for adjusting weights based on how many reps you get in the third set but seem to suggest this for setting the weight for your next workout. Yeah, okay, so it's a much more, sometimes you have to write a book or an article, you, you can't give the nuance parts, and maybe Michael will be able to get there right now with the nuances. In this article by Brian Mann, uh, he suggests that you do a fourth set with the adjusted weight in the same workout. Um, do you have an opinion on adding the fourth set to the Lorm protocol? Have you and your athletes ever done it this way? Would you see any advantages or pitfalls of doing two max rep sets rather than just one? So the, so if you go to the workout generator over there at Dan John University, we use the DeLorme protocol a lot. Um, in our standard training, you know, we'd have you do three sets of eight for two weeks, three sets of 10 for two weeks, three sets of 12 for two weeks. And really, for the general mass of humanity, you know, you do after that three sets of 12 week, you, sh you subtly shift the exercise, you know, the whole same but different idea. You go from, if you're doing kettlebells, double kettlebell presses to you know, maybe seesaw presses. 
barbells, you go from, you know, bench press to military to incliner. What Brian did for me is he gave us a range of numbers to work with. And so when I first use his numbers, this is what I did. And I, and I like it. Very quickly, all of you are going to find out an important thing is you just can't keep adding load. It just, it ceilings out. Now, of course, then you, okay. Once, if you're doing three sets of eight, there's going to be a load where you just can't keep improving reps on that third set. Well, then you go back to something like easy strength or another strength program. Get yourself a little bit stronger through, you know, the classic methods, you know, uh, you know, do reps, uh, have some variations, um, maybe mess with all kinds of other things. I'm getting too far already. But what I liked about Brian is he gave us the, the, the vision of how to increase loads carefully. When I first did this, this is how I understood to do it, and it worked well. We're doing three sets of eight, um, and on our third set of eight, we would do as many reps as we could. Now, remember, the difference between the way I coach three sets of eight and Brian is I like a tight one-minute rest when I coach my athletes on the three sets of eight protocol. It's not from DeLorme. It's from other stuff I learned in the 80s at the Olympic Training Center and from, from really smart people at the time is I like those tight one-minute rest periods when we do the higher rep stuff. It's not universally great for everything, but boy, it sure does some things. So on that third set, so I've built up, I've accumulated fatigue from the first two. So I did a set of eight, rested an exact minute, did a set of eight, rested an exact minute, so, and I always tell people, you come into that, you, you judge the load in that third set because you're huffing and puffing and woof or whatever, because sometimes these are hard. You know, you're doing front squats with this. My best for three sets of eight on the, with one minute rest is 265, 120 kilos. You know, by the time I got to the third set, I, I was still breathing hard from the first set. I didn't, I mean, I don't recover like people do online. I, it takes me a little bit longer. So on that third set, we would do as many reps as we can. Now, if you do, we'll just inflate the numbers, okay, just to blow up. I mean, if you do 16 to 20 reps on that last set, well, clearly the weight's too, lo too low for you, and you've got to make a significant jump next time. If the weights are like, I don't know, in the area of like 11 to 13, 14, you know, you're probably strong enough to go up, but, you know, you're you're – you know, make sure those are good reps and quality. Uh, you know, if your reps are in that uh, 7 to 11 range, you know, you probably have a pretty good load right there. You might be a little light, but my suggestion to you would be, you know, do it one more workout and just see if that, if it, if it gets to 11, 12, 13, yeah, add weight then. Pro prove it to yourself twice. If your reps are 1, 2, or 3, Loads way too heavy. Go lighter next time. Four, five, six. You know, do a do a personal check in. You know, you know, see how things are going. You may have to lighten up. Six, seven. You may have to lighten up. Now, that's how I taught it with those strict one minute rests. According to what you're telling me here, Brian likes this idea of then sliding up with the new adjusted weights and testing it in real time. He has longer rest periods than I have, which is just fine. Uh, so say three sets of eight with two minute rest, three minutes. Minute. So at the end of that third set, we add, we add load or drop load and we retest the weights. Ideally on that fourth set, according to what you've summarized here, uh, it, you should hit that seven, eight, nine number almost exactly. I like the idea of doing the fourth set test. However, I like the idea of like you doing that once a week, maybe once every two weeks, that additional fourth set. So in my world, I would say this, I want you to do three sets of eight with this load. On that third set, we're gonna look at the, the load because you got this, we're gonna adjust it, we're gonna do it one time. Okay, we did three set, two sets of eight. We got to the third set, we, we chased uh, reps. After that, we then add load or drop load and test that weight. I like that if you're a relative beginner, three sets of eight as written is just fine. Three sets of 10 will come after that. Three sets of 12 will come after that. 
as you slide up and get more and more competent in the DeLorme protocol. I like the idea of maybe once a week, let's just say Saturday, just to save my brain all the extra work, you do four sets of eight, and the fourth set is always that adjusted attempt. When you come back in the gym the next day, let's say it's Monday or Tuesday, uh, you can you can chase the adjusted load. So, so say uh, I was using uh, 100. When I come in on that next workout Monday, um, I was using 100 for my three sets of eight. We adjusted the load because I got mm, 14 reps to 110. On Monday, I can come in, I can either try three sets of eight with 110 or stick at 100 the next workout Wednesday, stick to 100, and on the Saturday workout, then attack that new load. So give yourself a hard, normal, normal, hard, and then on that that Saturday, okay, next week, because I nailed it again, I am going to move my all my lifts up to that 110. All right, there's nothing wrong with that. That's going to work a while, and then it won't, and then you're going to have to move that test day, that Saturday, to every other Saturday, because you're just, you know, once you start sneaking up on that, uh, on that, uh, I hate to call it a barrier, but once you start sneaking up on that really good load, that's where you're going to be. Um, if you want to try that every two weeks for a while, and once you feel yourself starting to stagnate, slide yourself back into easy strength or another program, get your strength back up with maybe lower reps, that three to five rep range. Um, I like it. Uh, I like the idea of adding that fourth set, but I think you have to be really uh, judicious about it. You have to take your time, kind of fold your arms, because once you start, once you start chasing, um, so you've increased a set and you've increased reps and you've increased load, that's triple progression. And I think it's, I personally think it's hard to increase three things at once. So don't be afraid to try that day. Go back to what you were doing. One, two workouts. Try that new load. Make the decision. And then uh, then go up and load. But I hope the lesson that I'm trying to get across is, uh, is, is, is clear. The idea that when you do progressive resistance exercise, be sure you progress. You take your time going from step to step to step. Um, I don't trust these programs that try to make you do everything all at once, everywhere. I think it's tough. I think it's not repeatable. And it's real hard to figure out what happened when things go wrong. I enjoyed that question. Uh, and thanks, Michael, for, uh, for really helping me understand it even better with your question. Thank you. We have a question from Greg. I like having a solid morning routine, and as do I. Recently, I've decided to tack on a bit of body weight exercises uh, to the end of my routine before I start my day. My goal isn't really to make a ton of progress, but more philosophically to start every day, making sure I can move my own body through space in various ways. I think that's awesome. Okay, on the non-workout days, I do one easy set each of body weight squats, push-ups, and pull-ups with a one-minute plank after each. Great. What do you think is a good balance ratio of reps in these three movements? For each pull-up, how many push-ups and squats should I be able to do? Would these ratios change if I were programming them for progress? Yeah, um, that's actually that's actually the million-dollar issue right there. In my world, I think that the push, the pull, and the squat should all be the exact same numbers. But the bells ring because doing push-ups, and you can do a lot of push-ups. Uh, Barry Mamini and I in high school uh, for our president's test, uh, we, we found out, I can't remember how, but somebody from the period before us did 100, of course. So, you know, Barry and I came into the thing just going to try to smash whatever that person did. Don't remember who did the most. And since I don't remember, it probably wasn't me. Uh, but it is a, you can do a lot of push-ups. And you can do a lot of uh, body weight squats, but most people can't do a lot of pull-ups. So the pull-up is going to be, you're, you're saying they're body weight, but 
push-ups and squats are different than pull-ups. They just are. I would try to get you to think something along these lines. I would try to keep your push-ups and your squats almost the exact same number. Now, a lot of people can easily crank out a lot more body weight squats than they can push-ups. Uh, you, you do pay a higher, higher price when you do a lot of push-ups. You know, you get that real weird uh, uh, soreness right through here. Um, for your pull-ups, I don't know, let's, let's just make up a number and have you test it. Uh, for every push-up or squat, maybe a pull-up. Uh, I think that's uh, reasonable. If, it's, if you're a really good pull-upper, maybe you could do a 1-5. So, but if you think about it this way, if you decide to do 50 squats and 50 push-ups, you know, depending on which one you want to use, that's either five or 10 pull-ups. Uh, what you might want to do, and anybody listening to try this idea, is try to maybe put an earlier low end, a bumper right there on push-ups and squats. So it's going to be 50-50, and then just see what the pull-up number is. The key I want you to think about, Greg, and I like this question, is um, with your pull-ups, if, if you're banging away on your pull-ups every day and you're going to failure on them, you're gonna, your elbows are going to, you didn't tell us your age, but your elbows are going to be barking at you very loudly, very quickly. Um, so try to find a repeatable number of pull-ups you can do that you just pop up and you get them in, you shake out, you feel good. You have plenty of re uh, you have plenty of reps left in the pull up. For example, if you get yourself in a situation where fifty push ups, uh, fifty squats, and twenty five pull ups all feel about the same, well, uh, well, you're a better man than I. I'll tell you that, and I and I think that's what you want to do. I would probably put a ceiling early on the number of push ups and squats because as a lot of people will tell you. You can do a lot of push-ups and a lot of body weight squats. You can really do that. Um, in high school, we used to get the deck of cards and you'd flip it over and was it, I don't remember, but uh, numbered cards, you do two, you know, a two was two, three was three, a four was four. Um, aces, I think were 11, and then all face cards were 10. So if you got a run uh, of uh, face cards in a row, you might have knocked out 50 while your partner, you know, only did, you know, 20 or something like that. You can do a lot of push-ups. You can do a lot of body weight squats, but you can't do a lot of pull-ups for most people. So I hope that helps. It's it's a very good question, okay? we got a question here from Matt. And I got to tell you, I, I, I'm not sure about this, Matt, but uh, you asked it, so I'll answer it. How tall are you now? Well, I'm six foot. I'm, I'm an actual six foot, by the way, not one of those liars you bump into constantly throughout life. Um, I remember one time they had me in a, in a thing at, when I was at Utah State and had me listed at uh, 6'3", 240 pounds with a 4.0. And it was interesting as I was six foot uh, to 18 and with a 4.0. And it was just kind of funny. Um, so I have my height hasn't changed ever. And he says this. How tall did you used to be? I used to be six foot. Now, when I was younger, I was smaller. And then uh, as I grew up, I got taller. Uh, I've noticed my grandchildren do the same thing. And so do my daughters. I, in fact, as I, I don't, don't remember it, but I started out really small. And then I got much, much bigger. Um, my growth spurt was, my biggest growth spurt, well, I had a big one in seventh grade. And then... Uh, my sophomore year, and then the biggest change in my life came uh, when I first started training at the Pacifica Barbell Club, and I put on 40 pounds in four months. It was awesome. Um, it was, you know, just eating a lot of food and doing so many front squats. Um, he follows up, and do you feel any activities or injuries have contributed to a loss of height for you? Uh, since I haven't lost any height, I would say I haven't had any issues with that. Then he asked an interesting question. How old do you feel both mentally and physically? Um, just did a major uh, physical uh, with my doctor. Um, there, people are always shocked. Uh, I, as you know, I'm 67. Uh, I'm very strong. I'm fairly lean. My blood profiles are outstanding. Um, 
uh, there was a problem about me. I told the story before a couple of years ago where there was a mistake on my cholesterol readings. The machine was out of what I, there was a problem with the machine and it came back that, you know, my, my cholesterol numbers had shot up. And so Dr. Brunetti sent me to uh, a cardiac uh, care guy who was wonderful. God, great. And they put me on a stress test and this stress test sucks. It really does, you know. I mean, I, the hardest thing for me, you can't drink coffee for two days. And then they show this thing on your neck like this, this horse collar. And then they, they're going to put you through the uh, the MRI machine. And just before they put you in, they inject you right here with a needle. And, well, I don't know what the chemical is, but it makes you really anxious. I, it makes you feel you're, like you're caught in an elevator and you have to fight somebody. It, it It's all that at once. And just before I went in, the, the nice uh, the nice guy doing the thing, uh, the technician leans in and he goes, he says, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. John, oh, what are you here for? I go, uh, they think there might be something wrong with my heart. And he goes, okay. I go, I go, why? He goes, well, your resting heart rate is 52. And, you know, usually people's heart rates go, I go, my heart rate is going up. And so that was a good sign. So I would say physically, you know, the old joke, you know, I have the body of an 18 year old uh, stuffed in my car. Terrible joke. I'm a horrible person. Uh, mentally, I'm in a good place. Um, it's a harder thing to measure. Um, I, I have a great social life. I play on a trivia team. I dance every Thursday night. I travel around the world. I read uh, two, three, four books a week. Uh, I think pretty good on both ends, but uh, thank you. It's a, it's a different kind of question, but thank you. Okay, we got a question from Sean. And Sean, I think I know uh, from the old Dragon Door Forum. As someone with an expansive background in strength and conditioning for both Q2, that's my term for collision sports and collision athletes, and Q4, which is the rare ones, uh, one quality athlete, 100 meter runners or um, sp Olympic lifters or something like that. And in coaching American football, how does that change the lens of how you perceive sports as a fan, either watching in person or on TV. What insight does your experience provide to you as a sports fan when watching these sports, either in person or TV? I was specifically interested in your answer regarding American college football and or college basketball. I don't watch college basketball. I don't, yeah, I guess I do during March Madness because it's kind of fun. But would be interested to hear your thoughts on any other sport you enjoy watching. So, the longer you coach, the more and more people like to sit with you at games. Uh, my buddy Mike just said the other day, um, this year I watched the Super Bowl at my daughter's house, but usually I watch it with Mike. And he goes, I missed you this year. And I go, well, really? Why? He goes, because you know football. And it's nice to be with somebody who knows football watching a game. Um, I I tend to be much less of a, of a fanatic. Uh, a fan is short for fanatic. I don't... Uh, I, I don't have necessarily real highs or real lows when I'm uh, cheering for a team. Sometimes I will, uh, but that's usually um, it's usually Schadenfreude. Um, this year, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado came up here to play at University of Utah, and uh, University of Utah, because of the injuries, had a really fine quarterback. He went to the College of San Mateo, but he was a fifth string quarter. He was Utah's fifth string quarterback. And of course, all the media attention was on the coach on the Colorado team. You know, everyone's saying he's the greatest coach of all time. And Utah, with a fifth string quarterback, shut them down. And the only reason uh, Colorado was even in the game is because, you know, they had, they had one or two really superior athletes. And Utah was so injured that they were struggling at defensive back. So, so. I will get some schadenfreude sometimes when I think uh, someone uh, gets a lot of attention that they don't deserve. Um, and I apologize for that because that's a weakness. But yeah, I like the game. I tend to, I tend to sit a little bit more like this, you know, you know, I, I, I uh, sometimes I'll be watching a game and I'll say something like, I, that, 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 this makes no sense to me. 
And then someone will say, what do you mean? I'll, I'll explain the thing. And then like 10, 15 minutes later, I go, oh, I get that now. Okay. Yeah, I just, so I do have a coach's mindset. Um, the hardest thing for me to watch in sports is Olympic lifting and uh, the throwing events in track and field. Because, um, okay, so I'm going to get in this, this position again. Your, your margin of error is just so small. Now, you know, you can say, well, well, uh, baseball is the hardest sport because it's so hard to hit the ball. But, you know, you get a couple of chances at it. You know, you get, you know, um, you get three balls and two strikes and fouls. So you could get, I think the record is like 17 or 18 pitches um, in, in Major League Baseball for the most pitches ever to one person. But let's just say you get eight chances to hit the ball in the discus and in the shot and the hammer and the javelin and Olympic lifting, especially the, in, this, in, the, in the squat snatch, you know, your margin for error is so small and everything else could be perfect and one thing goes wrong and the weight doesn't flip over where it needs to be or the throw goes out of bounds or whatever. So for me, um, when you see me at a track meet, even if, even if I don't even know the thrower, I'll tend to get a little, uh, like, thrower empathy that I start to, oh, no, oh, no, you know, or, yeah, or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I I don't really comment much, much on basketball. I don't, the, the modern game is just so different than I know um, with, and I'm a big fan of the money ball stuff, big fan of it. But you know it's it's dunk and three point shot, dunk three point shot, and and I and I appreciate it. It's a it's a far different game um, that I that I know anything about. But with American football, uh, yeah, um, I'm pretty good about time management and how to how to use the clock, and I think that's because I coached at uh, at programs that were academically superior to the schools we were facing. But athletically, we were not. So if you can get, if you can really fully understand American football time management, uh, you can uh, kind of edge yourself into a better chance to win. Um, one of my mentors, I don't talk about him as much, uh, the late, great uh, Rick Bojack. I remember him one time after church. Uh, we used to go to St. Joseph the Worker together. And I just, I just asked him a question. Uh, and he said, oh, yeah, I'll yell at my quarterbacks if they break the huddle too quickly because the offense he run was called the, the veer. And he, and he would always say to me, nothing stops the veer. So his, his goal for the first half of the game was to make that first half, half happen very quickly. So he'd get mad if his running backs ran out of bounds and stopped the clock for any reason. He wanted that first half to be... <laughs> His, he told me one time his perfect game was this. Uh, the final score would be 21 to nothing, and I would have my quarterback take a knee before he goes into the end zone. Because uh, he originally told me the perfect game was 28 to nothing, where his team scored one touchdown per quarter and ate the entire quarter up time-wise. So, you know, when you're around people like that, you begin to see a game differently. Um, it's always my concern with when I see a, uh, an inferior team throwing the ball on every down because they're speeding up the opportunities or uh, giving the, the uh, superior team more opportunities to have the ball. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little different, but uh, it's a fun question. Okay. Uh, I really, I really appreciate it. You know, I, I'm sure the number of people on the planet who are listening to that were going, yeah, I don't know what he's talking about, but that's awesome. Uh, it's my favorite kind of question to answer. All right. Thank you very much. We got a, a question um, from Peter. As a fellow English literature and fitness enthusiast, I've enjoyed your work for a long time. Well, thank you, Peter. I have a small question. I live on a farm, and that is my main way of building my muscles. Uh, farm strength is a real thing. Yeah. Keeping fit. I cut down trees with a saw and axe, chop wood, put up fences, etc. Loaded carries to keep fit. Anyway, part of my land is on a mountainous terrain, very hilly. I noticed the last day I had to carry loads up and down quite a long steepish hill that I could feel my legs working reasonably hard on both the up and the down part. In short, what are 
uphill and downhill carries like as a leg builder. I'm keen to build my legs up, uh, but I just find my legs are pooped after these and I don't have the energy to do any of the extra leg stuff. Well, you know, it'd be a, it would be a fabulous, fabulous training environment if that's what we did. Now, I have had a thing about hill sprints uh, for a long time. Uh, Percy Cerruti, of course, the great Australian uh, uh, track and field coach, was a big fan. Uh, the 49er, great 49er teams in the 80s, hill sprints were, were money. Now, let me just keep a couple variations of hill sprints. I do think that just carrying a heavy load up a mountainside might be one of the greatest glute workouts a human can do. Okay. Now, walking downhill, and you'll discover this right outside my window here is Mount Olympus uh, here in Utah. I think Mount Olympus is one of the hardest climbs I've ever done because Mount Olympus, no matter how you try to do it, it's basically straight up. And then after you get to the top, no surprises here, straight down. And the next day, your quads are so sore, not from the climb up the hill, but from that breaking down the hill. So, okay, now we're just, we're just winging this. This is your perfect hill workout. Um, heavy loads up the hill and then for the glutes and then going down the hill for the quads. And then we had one more thing that we did at Discus Camp for years. Uh, we, we work with a lot of uh, young female athletes who had knee issues, knee issues from uh, basketball and volleyball because the tall girls are always kind of pushed into those sports and not into something they do well in like track and field. Um, uh, walking backwards up hills builds that horseshoe muscle around the knee more than anything I've ever seen. Uh, if you, oh, By the way, I also have an answer if you don't have hills in just a moment. But uh, there is something magical about walking backwards up a hill with a load. Um, I think it's better than uh, leg extension or knee extensions. I think they're easier on the whole knee itself. And the burn you get is actually kind of funny. Now, if you don't have a hill, uh, which shocks me, um, I would suggest uh, getting a sled and don't go don't go crazy overloading the sled, but marching with the sled is one of the best ways I know how to, uh, you know, just a normal sled walk to build the glutes and then come backwards. I, we just turn the belt around at my gym and then walk backwards, you know, kind of a, a weird looking moonwalk. Okay, Tom asks a question. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, we've had a couple of double kettlebell front squat questions today. I've been trying my best to improve my double kettlebell front squat strength using your two, three, five rep schemes. I have worked up to 50 total reps with the 24 and 28 bells, but my next jump up in weight is to combine the 28 and 32. Uh, so you're going to have to do some switching uh, probably every round. Uh, I've tried this and it's too much for me. I collapse forward at the bottom after a rep or two. What should I do? Well, that's always a tough issue. Um, the second you added that extra four kilos, you fold it over. Um, one of the things I like about double kettlebell front squats, double kettlebell cleans, uh, double kettlebell presses, alternating presses, and that whole family of presses, is that it really does expose your weaknesses in your chain. Um, I love that phrase. We call it anaconda strength. You know, it's that squeeze strength. Uh, when you're when you're when you have the bells here, even if you're just standing with two with two thirty twos, just standing. As, as the weight pulls down, you've got to swing back up with the muscles that most Americans have almost forgotten about, like the rhomboids in that family, you know. So you're standing there and it's pulling you down. At the bottom of the squat, the load is taking, pulling you down between your hips. Um, I would say that in your case, you have an issue. <laughs> I always feel like I'm giving medical advice. You have an issue with anaconda strength. Uh, you have a little anaconda strength issue. Now, how are you going to build that? Um, I would, if I were you, I would go back and reread all my work, but well, I don't know why I said that. But one of the things I would think about is the two, three, five, ten protocol. Uh, so you're going to do a set of two, do a set of three, do a set of five. That's 10 reps, then do 10 more. 
but you're going to have to do them with those lighter bells, like the 24s. Doing double kettlebell front squats with 24s for 10, yeah, obviously, okay, it's twice as many as five, but it's not. It feels far harder than twice. The reps six, seven, eight, nine, ten, because you're under fatigue, because you're 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 fighting your the folding that you're getting because of the the weaknesses in the anaconda strength, is you've got to fight your way back on those reps, and it is hard. I watch strong people at these certs get bent over by those double twenty fours because they're strong and they can do all these amazing things and they can pass the snatch test, but they don't have that kind of strength to hold up over time. Tom, my answer to you is pretty simple. Try the two, three, five, ten. Um, you could easily just go two, three, five, ten, two, three, five, ten, two, three, five with the 24s. There's your 50. Uh, you might want to attempt in, in another workout Two, three, five, ten with the 24s, two, three, five with the 28s, two, three, five, ten with the 24s. So that'll get you through uh, maybe a week or so. And then I would add two, three, five, ten with the 24s. Do the 32 and, and the 28. Do two reps, three reps. So two reps, you know, switch three rep reps, and then switch three reps, two reps, two, three, three, two. There's 10 reps there, but you don't even get up to five and you don't even get up to 10. And it'll give you a chance to kind of work your way up through those. So, and the reason I'm saying two, three, three, two is so the, the when you switch bells, uh, you'll get the same reps on both sides. Um, I'd like to know how this goes. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a lot more common than I think, um, it's a lot more common than I think. That's interesting. But I think that a lot of people uh, get stuck when they add load because they get exposed where those weaknesses have been. Okay, good question, thank you. Ross uh, finishes up with a good question. My question relates to bus bench versus park bench training. So in my world, we use the word bus bench when we're talking about a workout, um, it's got a clear start, clear finish. Um, you're expected to be able to do something at the end of the time. Uh, if it doesn't work, you should be able to complain to somebody about it. And park bench training is when you kind of show up and you get the workouts in, you just show up and keep doing them. Uh, in my humble opinion, I think park bench workouts are far better than bus bench workouts for most of us most of the time. You recommend mostly park bench training oh, yeah, with the bus bench mingle in maybe twice a year for the average non-athlete in good health. My question pertains to the rite of passage as discussed in Enter the Kettlebell by Pavel and also the program discussed in The Return of the Kettlebell. Both programs have specific strength goals, goals as the minimum program requirement, but both talk about potentially taking a really long time to achieve. Would sticking with the rite of passage protocol until I can press a bell half my body weight be detrimental, de detrimental in the way sticking with a bus bench program too long can be? Or is the programming, which is mostly volume based and waving loads, be considered closer to park bench programs? Additionally, is it okay to have a specific strength goal with park bench training? Well, okay, so let's go to that first question first. Um, that last question first, I discovered in my life that unless there's three officials, uh, a crowd, a weigh-in, singlets, cards, uh, entry fees, it's not worth my time to chase maxes. Okay. I like to only max in competition. And the reason is, is because if you have the park bench mentality like I do, um, you want to always have enough in reserve, mentally reserved and physical reserve, that if the competition demands it, I can add more weight and have a run at it. So I think you can have a specific strength goal with park bench training, but you just have to kind of remember that, you know, not every day is perfect. Not every situation is perfect. You just have to have with it a, a, a little bit of, uh, you know, you know, Cervantes, he didn't say it in Don Quixote, he said another word, but it's it's the road, not the inn. So the thing about 
park bench mentality is you got to you got to fall in love with the road. You got to fall in love with the process. And when you do, you you stop focusing on I got to do this and you start focusing on yeah, that's good. I feel good about doing it. This feels good. So, to get to your big question about things like the rite of passage, you know, I've done the rite of passage. I've done, I've done uh, uh, the workouts in, uh, you know, uh, Return of the Kettlebell. In fact, you'll, you know, you'll see my name, I think, in both books. I think. I wrote the forward to Enter the Kettlebell, and a lot of my material is in the, the, the second book. Um, one thing I think a lot of people missed, Ross, and it still bothers me, and the, the, doesn't keep me up at night, but it bothers me. Before you moved on to the next, the return of the kettlebell program, that double kettlebell, Pavel expected you to be able to pass the Secret Service Snatch Test, which is 24 kilo bell, 200 reps in 10 minutes, and you should be able to press rather easily the... Uh, the 106 or the beast, the, the 106 pound, 48 kilo bell called the beast. Uh, when I did it, uh, I pressed the beast first just to get it out of the way because I knew that if I got 100 reps with the 20, uh, pardon me, 200 reps with the 24, I wasn't going to be too interested in doing anything else for a couple, uh, couple of days. That was a standard he put in there. Now, can you get those goals by just doing the rite of passage? Well, that's what I did. Uh, I was... Um, this is a while ago, and eh, not terribly long time ago, but a while ago. And I was getting ready for the RKC in San Jose. And then I was an assistant at the UCLA one. And then I was, and then I went up to, I think, Minnesota next for another one. And I was using the rite of passage as a means for me to have my hands on kettlebells three plus times a week and have a program that would support passing the snatch test being able to demonstrate all the moves and you know keep myself in reasonable shape. So the rite of passage can be used in that style like I did, where you come in, if you feel great, um, and don't forget, I tried to do the rite of passage with the 36. And I gotta tell you, I, I you know, Mike Brown still makes fun of me about trying to do that. Um, <laughs> but my thinking on doing the 36 was, since I had already gotten myself to 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 master all that other stuff. And by the way, when I did the rite of passage, it was always with the 28. That's the only thing I did the rite of passage with. But by sliding to the 36, my thought was, let's see what can happen if I just do clean and press, clean and press. Um, the problem was, uh, it's really hard with the 36 to get those ladders of one, two, three, four, five in. Um, my right side, my stronger side, seemed to have little little issue, but my left side, it did. So I'm hoping you understand what I'm trying to make with my point here. If you're using the 24 with the rite of passage and you're gonna to go to several certs back to back to back, you wanna be in good kettlebell shape back to back to back, it can park bench itself. If, however, you're chasing a dream, a tra chasing a goal, it slides over to park bench. Most good programs, are both it just depends on what you're you're kind of trying to do okay what you're what you're chasing um i think the rite of passage uh, especially if you use the very a variety days intelligently um i remember the one time i decided to do barbell deadlifts and turkish get-ups um and that actually worked pretty well so you know i had a heavy rite of passage day, a medium rite of passage day, uh, a light rite of passage day, deadlift, and Turkish get-ups. Um, I felt like I was really in a good place to coach at the certs um, and to and to you know survive the certs. So when when I did that, I think that was probably the best way for me to stay in kind of teaching conditioning. Okay, teaching. Teaching can be really hard, folks. It, it can be, to be on for three straight days in the sun, getting burned up with, you know, especially the way things used to be. Our dinners wouldn't even start until 10 o'clock at night. You, you you get to bed at one and you got to be up at six or five. So I could be the first in the field because that's what I was expected to do. Lucky me. To be in that kind of shape, it takes a program like that. 
all programs. Just kind of remember that. I, I don't know if the West Side guys would agree, but you could probably put together a West Side program that tends to be a little bit more park bench. You know, even as I said that, I thought about Jim Wendler's 531, which you can do uh, like my brother has. I think he's, my brother Gary has been doing it eight to 10 years. That's a long time to do a program. <laughs> That's a long time, but he's very park benchy. He's uh, just turned 75. He's a hammer throwing. He's doing great. Uh, that's, but you could also take that same program and just go, okay, we're going to get ready, you know, for football season and turn it into a, uh, a bus bench program. Like almost anything in life, you know, one or two aspirins will probably help you with whatever issue you're facing. One or 200 aspirins will probably make you have real tummy, tummy issues and maybe even end up somewhere you know, like, like an ambulance or something. So it's always in the dosage and the focus. Um, but that's a good question, Ross. Um, you could probably do the, ex to me, like I could be in the same gym with you, watching you do your rite of passage, and I might not even see when you jumped to wire it up to a bus bench program from a park bench. Okay, that's a good question, and I really appreciate it, okay? Well, that's it for this week. Wow, that was easy. Uh, I'm Dan John. Every week I sit down here and I answer your questions. If you have questions, send them to the podcast at this address, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And each and every week, I'll do my best to answer them all. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.